The following broadcast is brought to you by the friends and partners of Revival Ministries International. As you can see, we're still continuing on firepower. I can't get away from January camp meeting. So the title of the message today is called Keep the Fire Burning. And this is probably one of the biggest questions that we are asked when we travel is people say, how do you keep the fire burning all the years? How is it possible? Because the storms of life come to everybody. And how many of you sitting here today, you know people that used to be on fire, but they're not on fire today. Now, the Bible says, and I'm going to read from 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 5 from the Amplified Classic Version. Paul writing to Timothy, and he says, I'm calling up memories of your sincere and unqualified faith, the leaning of your entire personality on God in Christ, in absolute trust and confidence in his power, wisdom, and goodness, a faith that first lived permanently, which I love that word permanently, in the heart of your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm fully persuaded dwells also in you. That's why I would remind you to stir up. Everybody say stir up. Stir up. Stir up. Rekindle the embers off. Fan the flames off. Keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire that is in you by the means of the laying on of my hands with those elders at your ordination. So it's our job to stir up. It's our job to keep the fire burning. Now, how many have ever made a lot of natural fires? You know, you have a barbecue, whatever. Of course, some people do it the wrong way today. They don't know about kindling. You get the small twigs and and, and and like like a dry grass and you or paper and you use the kindling first and smaller sticks and then you put the bigger logs on later. They'll just take big logs and pour gasoline on it. And you've seen all the movies on Vimeo and YouTube with people burning their hair and all kinds of stuff trying to set. Uh, uh, you're just going to have a barbecue. It looks like they're trying to blow up the backyard, you know. So there's a way to light a fire. There's a way to get the fire burning. There's an art to making a fire. And there's an art to keeping it burning. When I go into the bush in Africa, which I don't get to do that often, but there are many times back in the past when I would be able to go and do that. And of course, I may be believing the Lord one of these days, I'll get to do that again, but I'll go for like 10 days. Well, you out in the bush and you have lion and all kinds of animals roaming around at night, it's important that you burn a big fire because that fire always keeps the animals away. And so that fire will be I mean, we'll do all our cooking on the fire. It'll be roaring and whatever. And you go inside the tent and you go to sleep. And at three, four in the morning, you know, you can't, you know, I'm already up because I'm going to be hunting at first light. And you go out there and you look at the fire. And that fire that was burning, that was roaring, is now just down. You can see a couple of coals and some embers. And so what I'll do is I'll take a stick and I'll just move all the dead stuff away and so that I get all the coals that are red and you can see them all there. You, you uncover them, move the ashes out the way and then I take smaller logs, put them on and then start putting big logs. Within 20 minutes, it's roaring again just like it was the night before. So you always have to keep that fire burning. If rain comes, rain can put the fire out. If winds come, winds can put the fire out. There's many things that, you, that will come to put out the fire. So he says, that's why I would remind you to stir up. Everybody say stir up. Stir up. Rekindle the embers off, fan the flames, and keep burning the gracious gift of God, the inner fire. Then he says here, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craven and cringing and fawning fear. So how do you know that the fire is waning in your life when you become timid? The moment you become 
timid and you back off where normally you would be bold. Somebody said, how can some people be bold? It's, it's because of fire. When the fire comes on you, you're not timid. You're not embarrassed. You're not worried about your own reputation or what other people are going to think. The fire supersedes your concerns. Can you say amen? But when the fire dies down, suddenly you think of the ramifications. Well, I can't do that. I can't say that. What will happen? And so then you are overcome with timidity of craven and cringing and fawning fear. But he, talking of God, has, has given us a spirit of power and of love and calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. And then look what he says in verse 8. Do not blush or be ashamed then. So there's many people in the church that are blushing and they're ashamed, like Peter was when he denied the Lord three times. Think of Peter when he denied the Lord three times and then Peter on the day of Pentecost preaching the Pentecost message. What happened to him? It was Peter before the fire and Peter after the fire. Are you with me? So there's always going to be a before and after picture. You, before the fire of God, will be timid. You'll be shy. You'll be embarrassed. You might even deny the Lord. You might just say, look, I'm not like those crazy people. Oh, we we saw you, you at the river. No, no, I was just visiting. I'm not like one of them. (laughs) They're crazy. They're loco. I just went there one time. When you're on fire, you say... What do you mean? I'm one of them. Well, they're just crazy. I'm even worse than they are. Don't ever belittle yourself and put yourself down. Because that's what the devil always tries to do is divide you and divide us. If he can divide us, he conquers us. I have media. Media come to me and say, now you believe in that prosperity. I always go, yes, I'm like overboard in it. I'm like excessive in it. And they go, oh, okay, and then they leave me alone. Because if I said, no, no, I'm not like those crazy people, then they've divided us. So I will never let, I said, I'm radical, I'm book of acts, lay hands on the sick, cast out devils, speak in other tongues. I'm I'm crazy into that. Oh, okay. There's no argument. Can you say amen? I'm not going to back down off of what God's doing to be acceptable in any place. I don't care if I'm kicked out of every place. I refuse to back down and compromise to become acceptable amongst men. That's it. So he says, don't blush or be ashamed then to testify to and for our Lord, nor of me, a prisoner for his sake, but with me, take your share of the suffering to which the preaching of the gospel may expose you and do it in the power of God. So there will come persecution. There will come a suffering that will take place because the devil hates the supernatural and he hates the power of God and he's not going to give you a free run up the side. Oh, you want to come here and take all these souls? Sure, come right in. You want to come and heal the sick? You want to come lay hands on the sick and cast out devils? Come. Come. You, I'll just step out the way while you just come do it. You think the devil's going to let you do that? Absolutely not. He's going to say, you come here. If you come here, you can bring a dead message. You can come here and you can preach some motivational thing, and I'll let you do that. But you come in here with the power and the anointing of the Spirit of God, all hell's going to break loose. And then it's according to the fire that's on the inside of you to whether you're going to prevail or not. So somebody said, what do you do in the middle of that? I stir it up, man. I'll be standing there. You can watch people staring and glaring. I look, stir it up. I go, I'm opening it up here tonight. We're either going to have a revival or we're going to have a riot. This will either be known as the great revival of 2019 or it'll be known as the great riot of 2019. We might have to keep a car running out the side door. But bless God. Come on, you you have to stir yourself up. Because there's always enough people from the wet blanket tribe that will come to try to put the fire out. Do not allow the wet blanket tribe to put the fire out. Amen. Amen. Say this after me. I refuse refuse to allow allow the wet blanket tribe 
of religious coneheads to put the fire out in me. Amen. So stir up, rekindle, fan the flame up, keep burning. If we do this in the natural, we have to do it in the spiritual. And you do that every morning. There are days you wake up and you just, uh, I don't even feel like getting out of bed. But you can't lie in bed. You have to get up. You have to go and do what you need to do. And then you just stir yourself up. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Fan the flame. And you have to protect the fire in its infancy when it starts. But then once it takes off you, you just throw a log on, just throw a log on every now and then, just keep it going. Monday logs, Tuesday logs, Wednesday logs, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Hang around people that are on fire. Don't hang around people that just smoke. <laughs> we have that inner fire that's been lit by the Holy Ghost. Amen. Can you say amen? amen? This fire helps in purifying us and making us a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. It's like gold that's refined in the fire. When I was a little boy, we used to go fishing a lot. And my dad would make the, the weights, the sinkers. How many of you have ever gone fishing and you needed a weight to carry it out? I had this huge 11-foot rod with a pen reel. And I was, I mean, a little boy, I learned how to cast that thing and move it out. I could, I could cast from far. I mean, there's a whole art to doing it, but you had to have the right weight on it. And so we would go to the scrap yards and we would get the weights on the tires that they used to balance the tires. And we'd get all these lead pieces. And my dad would take them home and he would build a furnace. And we would, you know, he had a thing that would create wind for the furnace and get the thing hot. And he had this special pot that he threw all the lead in there and it melted. And then he would take a ladle and he would scoop off the top. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, all the impurities because of the fire is coming to the top. And, and he would scoop up all the impurities off of this lid. So I knew that it worked the same with gold. It works the same with silver. Are you with me? So the impurities come to the top. And then he would take what was now liquid lead and would pour it into the mold and he would take it and just let it for a few minutes and then open it, but tap it out on the ground in these beautiful, shiny sinkers that we used to cast and for fishing were there. And he would fill up this bag full of lead and that was a great fun before you're gonna go on your fishing trip, we would do that. And so the Lord comes with his fire and he burns with his fire and all the impurities come to the top. That's why people come around revival and come around the anointing and then they go, oh, no, that's terrible. What's that? I didn't even know that was there. Well, without the fire, you wouldn't even know that there was that impurity. So don't run from it and say, no, no, I don't want that thing dealt with. Just say, Lord, whatever is not of you, let it go. That attitude, that thing that is holding me back, I don't want any of that. I want all impurities to be removed by the fire of God. A lot of people run from the fire, but don't run from the fire. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 20, but in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. How many want to be a vessel unto honor? It says here, sanctified, which is, means the word set apart, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, which is right standing with God, faith, charity, love, peace with all them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender stripes. And a servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, and the Bible says, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. So, as a minister of the Lord, of course, our job is to preach the word. We have to reprove, rebuke. I do a lot of that. If you follow me online, I reprove, rebuke. And you know what? There's people that will come against me, or whatever, but then privately we start messaging and they change the whole attitude. 
They go, okay, I understand now. I see what you're saying. Because people have been indoctrinated by the media. They've been indoctrinated by everything. And so I'm going to send you this book. I'm going to send you that. I'm, this is going to help you. And then two days later, we overnight the stuff to them. And they say, oh, I've got all the stuff. Thank you so much. Now they're going to come to the conference, you know. But, they, but, but I mean, you have, to, you, have to, you have to rock some people. Just say, absolutely not. That's rubbish. You can't believe that nonsense. Are you with me? Obviously, with words, they can't hear the tone in your voice. But... If you know me, I'm always using humor because humor has a lot of joy with it and a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down. Amen. It's like a truth, it's extraction. You have to be distracted while they take your tooth out. How many know what I'm talking about? So we need, we need this fire, the same fire that purges us, protects us, and empowers us for service. And as long as you stay in the fire, the devil won't be able to get close to you. Are you with me? The fire is the safest place. The fire was the safest place for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Because Jesus was right in the fire with them walking. Can you say amen? But if you were an enemy, it's the worst place to get near the fire. The safest place was inside the fire. The safest place for you will be right in the middle of the fire of God. Now, somebody said, why is all this talk of fire? Well, you know the Bible says in Luke 3, 16, John the Baptist said, I baptize with water, but there's one coming after me who's going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. Was talking about Jesus, the baptizer in the Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus is not only our Savior, but he is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost and fire. Why does he come to baptize you? Because you need this fire. You need this fire to live an overcoming life. You need this fire so you can walk in victory. Fire in the natural, when a rocket launches from one of the space centers, fire causes that rocket to break the gravitational pull of the earth. Fire on your life will cause you to break the gravitational pull of sin, the flesh, and the world. Fire will help you overcome. There is nothing wrong with you. There's nothing that you are facing right now that the fire of God couldn't break you out of, break you through, that you'll come through the other side. It's the fuego de Dios, the fire of heaven that will move you, that will launch you, that will take you to places, that will take you like it's carried us to 63 countries of the world. It's the fire of God that will bring you out of where you are and God will begin to use you regardless of who you are. As we sang in that song earlier here today, it's that fire, that holy fire. You can either have it now if you have it now, it will come and it will burn out all the dross, the fear of man, all the things of the flesh, the things that will hold you back, which just so you know, everybody has them. I know there's some people who they think they have no problems, but I've never met one person in all my travel that didn't have some problems. I had people that pretended to have problems, Oh, no problem, but their problem was pride. There is not one person that doesn't have problems that they need God to help them overcome. Amen. Not one. Somebody said, why do you emphasize that? Because some people think they're better than others. Well, I didn't do what he did. No, but you're doing as bad on this side. The Bible says if you hate your brother, you murdered. Well, I didn't use a knife. No, you didn't need to use a knife. You just hate him. The Bible says if you look after a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery. Somebody said, oh, it's terrible. Look what that person did. Yeah, but you're doing it anyway. Hello? Somebody said, no, I didn't do it. Yeah, if you thought it in your heart, you've done it. 
Same as they, they, they did the action, but you've done it. Just nobody's found out about it. Why is it getting so quiet here now? Suddenly. That's why the Bible says there's no one righteous, no, not one. Are you with me? Yes. Some of the worst people are religious people. Because on the outside, they look all perfect, but inside their hearts are filled with wickedness and everything imaginable. I could deal with a total sinner, a drunkard, an alcoholic, and whatever else they got a problem with, but I have a hard time dealing with religious people that really think they're hung the moon when really, in reality, Lord, have mercy. Deliver us from all evil. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees. He rebuked them. Jesus, the greatest opposition against his whole ministry was from Pharisees and Sadducees. He said, you cross land and sea to make one convert, and when you do, you make them twice the devil of hell that you are. People run around and put other people into bondage, put them into captivity. They leave people with a greater burden than what they found them. Because that's what religion does. Religion will put a burden on you that it's impossible for you to carry. It's impossible. What does Jesus say? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Hallelujah. 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 He will come. He will lift that heavy burden. He will lift even religion and tradition. You see, some people used to snort cocaine and now they snort religion. No, I'm serious. You listen to me. You listen to what I'm saying right now. Some people come out of the world bound by the devil, bound by everything that hell has to offer. Then they come into church and they get bound up again by, this time, by religion. Legalistic. If they had their way, they'd be executing everybody. I must have really struck gold here right now because it got really quiet here in this place. That's why I don't hang around ministers that all they do is criticize other ministers. I, I say, I'm out of here. I'm too busy. I'm focused on cities and nations and bringing in the harvest. If you want to sit and spend your time talking about, I'm not even interested. In extra fact, we'll just pray right now for those people. Can you say Amen. I hate it. Whenever I'm around some people and they start talking about this preacher, and blah, 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 I just, I'm, I'm out of here. Guys, carry on, knock yourself out. I'm, I'll see you later. I'm going to the restroom. Because you know you're in trouble when all that can come out of your mouth is picking other people to pieces. Amen. Hello. Amen. Come on now. So you can have the fire now or you can have the fire later. You say, when will I get the fire later? At the judgment seat of Christ. Where your whole life, Tim was talking about it earlier, will be put on the altar. The fire of God will come and out of it will either come wood, hay, and stubble or gold, jewels, and precious stones. And that will be eternal treasure that you'll carry in. Who would rather have the fire now than the fire later and then find out that you have nothing You have nothing to show for your life on the earth. I'd rather just say, okay, let the fire come now, burn everything that's not of God, and, you know, just let it all go so that only what remains is of the Lord. So you either get the fire now, fire later, or you're going to get hell fire, but you will get fire one way or the other, and you have to make that choice. Can you say amen? How many know that hell is a real place with a real fire that does not stop burning? Somebody said, God wouldn't do that. He's a God of love. Yes, it's because he's a God of love that he has a place called hell. But hell was not made for you. Hell was not made for God's people. Hell was made for the devil and all of his angels. Are you with me? Did you know this? And this might come as a shock to you, that if we were able to go to hell right now and give people an option of coming out if they would serve God, they would cuss us out and tell us to get the hell out of hell. They would. 
to this day. Somebody said, no, they'd be suffering down there. They would want to come out. No, they might want to come up, but they do not want to serve God. And that's why there's a place called hell. You say, why would they not want to serve God? Because they're wicked and they are evil. And that's why we preach the gospel to a lost and dying world, to tell people there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. You don't have to go to devil's hell. Jesus will save you. And he comes to the humble, to the humble. I don't deserve any of this. I'm going to humble myself to receive it. A humble man gets what he doesn't deserve. Are you with me? How many are glad that God gives you what you don't deserve? Are you with me? Yes. Amen. I'm so thankful that we don't get what we deserve. I'm so glad that he has mercy and grace on us. And that's why we need to have some of that mercy and grace extended towards other people as well. Amen. Now, just quickly, the testimony that I have, I was raised in Pentecost, born again at the age of five, baptized in the Holy Ghost when I was eight years of age. But I always tell people that Luke 3 and 16 always bugged me because I would read about where it said that Jesus would baptize you in the Holy Ghost and fire. And I saw many people in Pentecost, they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, but I personally didn't think they had fire. Yeah. I didn't think they had fire. I share the testimony of the three people that would always be set off in the service. If it was like a smidgen of anointing, then suddenly Brother Rabba Babanda would, I mean, jump up in the middle of the, Rabba Babanda, scare everybody. I mean, if you're sitting there and some big guy jumps up, Rabba Babanda, you think, what? Somebody's bondage, what's going on here? And that would trigger Sister Hikiki Kula. That, that's all the, the words she had in tongues. He had Rabba Babanda. She had Hikiki Kula. Hikiki Kula. I thought Kula. Who's Kula? Hata Kula. Whatever. And that would trigger Sister Rukundu. Rukundu, Rukundu, Rukundu. That was the only word she had. So you, and I, I looked at them. And then people said they had the Holy Ghost, but I didn't think they had the fire. All he had was a Rabba Babanda, and she had a Hikikikula, and he had, and, and the other one had a Rukundu. That's all they had. So there's many people, you know, they speak in other tongues, but they, it's not just about the language, it's about the fire, the fire of the Holy Ghost, which is so important. On the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost came. The Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were with one accord in one place. And suddenly, suddenly, there came a sound from heaven like a rushing, mighty wind filled the place. And then there appeared fire on each head. And then they were all filled and they began to speak with other yes. tongues. Yes. But today, the church speaks, but you don't hear a wind. Nobody's filled, and there's no fire on any head. They just sit there looking like a religious person. No fire, because fire moves you. You can't say you have the fire of God and you don't win souls. You can't say you have the fire of God and you just come to church and sit on your blessed assurance every Sunday, but you're not active. You're not out there telling the people about Jesus. When the fire of God comes on you, you can't be quiet. You have to tell other people. And I knew that God had called me to the ministry. I knew that God had told me that I would travel to the nations of the earth. I knew it from a little boy, but I knew that if I was gonna go, I had to have the fire. And let me tell you, those that are called here, that God brought you here so you could be raised up, I beg of you, please do not leave this place until the fire of God is on the inside of you and that fire consumes your life. Are you listening to me? If you leave here, Without the fire, it would be better for you that you had never come. It would be better for you just to be part of some dead religious church who didn't know that there was even a fire that was available. Then at least you go, go build a halfway decent religious ministry. And you could do some speaking engagements. and write some books. Fire! (laughs) 
just like that. A fire that cannot be quenched. A fire that will burn in you. A fire that will get stronger and stronger till the day that Jesus comes to take you home. You're going to go make lunch? You're going to go cook lunch? Well, you're going to eat sushi? Well, you're going to heat something up. You're going to put a fire under it. Huh? 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 You're going to go to a restaurant? They're going to bring you out a steak just raw? Just raw? How do you like your steak? Just bring it raw. You have your dog under the chair. Fido, yeah, is a chunk of meat. No, you, they can put it in. You can at least have it, you know, red. I like mine well done, you know, to, at least. Yeah. I don't like raw meat. I'm not a dog. Eat with blood running down your cheeks. Besides, when you get to heaven, you want to hear God say, well done. <laughs> Not medium rare, thou good and faithful servant. Well done. Can you say amen? Don't be like a religious TV dinner where you're hot on the outside and frozen on the inside. Who's ever stuck something in the microwave and you let it there and you pulled it out and you cut into the chicken, it was hot, hot, you, you burnt your mouth. But when you got in the middle, it's tough. You, you look at this ice on, in the middle. It's hot on the outside and frozen on the inside. That's how many people in the church are. Hot on the outside and frozen on the inside. God wants you cooked all the way. I mean, all the way to the bone. I mean, in the world, they go b -b 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 bad to the bone. But God wants you good, 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 good to the bone. I mean, cooked through, through and through. And it's the fire of God that will come. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Say this off to me. I'm good, 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 good to the bone. I'm good, 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 bad to the bone. Good, 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 good to the bone. So something happened in 1978. My eldest brother, I have two older brothers, one 14 years older than me, and then one 12 years older than me, my, my brother 14 years older than me, died suddenly, which was a great shock to the family. He was 31 years old, a wife and three children. We were never, he was in the ministry. I mean, we, I was in a band, he taught me to play guitar. I mean, this is my big brother, you know. I remember standing at his deathbed. I was only 17 at the time, and I was so angry, you know. I told the devil, you're going to rue the day that you touch my family. Let me tell you right now, this is going to cost you. And I didn't even know what I was praying. I said, the day will come when people will laugh at you all over the world. I didn't know God would give me a ministry of joy, which we have a ministry of joy. But that started a hunger and a desperation in me. This July will be 40 years when the fire fell on me. In the month of July of 1979, back in the last century, through hunger and desperation, I cried out to God that the fire would come on me, even though I was already back, I already spoke in other tongues. I already had the Lord speak to me in an audible voice. I already saw the gifts of the Spirit in operation, but I wanted the fire. I said, Lord, I've got to have your fire. I even told the Lord, Lord, either you come down and touch me or I'm coming up there to touch you. But we can do this either way, you know. I was not threatening the Lord. I have the highest respect for God, would never threaten him. But I got so hungry, I started to shout. And I said I shouted so hard and so loud that I lost my voice. My voice got hoarse. Who's ever done that and your voice got hoarse? And I always jokingly play with the words and say, my voice got hoarse. I nearly got on the horse and rode away, you know. 
It's just a play on words. Some people, he got on a horse and rode away. No, it's just a terminology. You understand what I'm talking about? It doesn't tra translate well into Japanese. You understand? <laughs> so I can't tell that in the foreign fields because they don't know what I'm talking about. But the fact of the matter that I was desperate and I shouted for about 20 minutes, God, I want your fire. And then suddenly, it was like somebody poured honey or warm liquid all over me or poured petrol or gasoline and then set me ablaze from the top of my head to the soles of my feet instantaneously. If you looked at me, you said, that man's been drinking. Like you snap your finger. I was beside myself. I was laughing uncontrollably. I was weeping at the same time. How many of you have ever in the natural laughed and cried at the same time? Did you know that that is a natural occurrence? Everywhere I travel in the world, if I ask that question, people raise their hand because that's a natural occurrence. Just in the natural, without the Holy Spirit. That, that just means you're overwhelmed, you laugh, you cry. But I was laughing, I was crying and speaking other tongues and I didn't know what to do. My whole body felt like on fire. So I went around and just started laying hands on everybody and they all just started falling on the power. I was only 18 years old. I was only 18 years old. I started laying hands on everything that moved. We were on a bus. We were coming from a conference. There was not even a Pentecostal conference. It was a Methodist conference. It was Anglicans. There were Presbyterians. There were Dutch Reformed. This was 19, uh, you know, uh, 79. And it was, it was actually a conference for the beginnings of the discussion of the dismantling of apartheid in Southern Africa. And I represented my high school. At the time, it was my final year in high school. And there were people from other high schools. And I was hanging out with all these girls. They were coming from Grahamstown High School for girls. And there was an Anglican school. But you know, I was, someone said, you were hanging out with the girls? Was that what you do when you're 17 years old? You hang out. I mean, you read the scripture, blessed art thou amongst women, you know what I'm saying. You know, well, <laughs> I just turned 18, so it's right past my 18th birthday. This is July. So I lay hands on all of them. They're falling under power. They knew nothing about the Holy Ghost. They knew nothing about speaking other tongues. And they were under their anointing, speaking other tongues. They went back to their high school, and a revival broke out that ran for three whole years that shook that high school. Let me tell you right now, I didn't even know that. So years later, I had no clue what had happened. But that started me on my journey. When the fire hit me, I wanted to pray for everybody to get the fire. Because if you get the fire, your whole life will be changed. It's what Socrates even said. He said, this man did something to me. I don't know what he did to me. But I didn't do anything. I just put the fire on him. You can take a Greek and put fire on him, and he's going to do some amazing things. You can take an Italian. You can take a Frenchman. You can take an American. You can take... It doesn't matter what tribe and tongue, but you put fire on them. They will do the amazing things for the kingdom of heaven. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, Aboriginal man by the name of Yondi from, from the outback of Australia came to the meetings in Brisbane, Australia. The fire of God hit Yondi. He was shaken. He shook for days under the anointing. They took him on the plane. He was shaken. He was, was under power. He told one of the missionaries, I'm going to go to my village. They said, no, don't go to your village. We're not ready to start a church. He said, I can't wait for you to start a church. I have to go to my village. He went to his village of 600 people. The whole village fell under the power. The people were lying in the streets of the village. They had to come with buckets of water and put it on them because the people would bake in the hot Australian sun under the anointing of God. What could not touch the Aboriginal people as missionaries had gone for years. They couldn't touch them. They couldn't get them free. They would get them down to a six beer limit. The fire of God hit the Aboriginal out back of Australia. They dropped the alcohol. They dropped everything and the fire of God began to spread to remote villages. That fire spread across Papua New Guinea into the high mountains of Papua New Guinea, into remote villages. The fire of God spread into remote places in China. And I'm, I'm oh, Raka Pastor Profo. It's got nothing to do about one man and a ministry. It's got to do about the ministry of the Holy Ghost. We are just instruments. We are just people that light fires. Many try to take a man and put them on a pedestal and worship a man. We're not to worship a man. We're to worship Jesus. But Jesus is. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Ghost and fire. Jesus is the one that will come and set your heart ablaze. Jesus is the one that will come and ignite you. And when he ignites you, your life will never be the same. God will use you You'll become a powerful tool in the hand of God. 
in spite of all the things that would hold you back, in spite of your insecurities, in in spite of all of the things of the flesh and that would hold you back. The fire will come. God will use you to where your friends and your family and your loved ones that rub their eyes out. And I can't even believe that. Is that my husband? Is that my wife? That cannot be my child. That cannot be my mother. That can't be my father. Something is different about them. But when the hand of God comes on you and the fire of God comes on you, let me tell you, God will raise you up. And I don't care what area of life you find yourself in. If you will be used of God, you have to have the anointing. You have to have the fire of God, whether you are in ministry or business or in government or whatever realm you find yourself. You are not gonna be able to do the purpose and plans of God without the anointing. Without the fire of God, you will never be able to succeed. You will receive the success that man can offer but with the fire of God you'll break every boundary you'll break every barrier and you'll accomplish heaven's purpose and heaven's plan can you say amen so you have to get desperate you have to get hungry you have to get thirsty you have to get desperate hungry and thirsty and you can just live like that just live like that I live like that all the time I'm not going to get complacent. Somebody said, well, you've had a good run. What do you mean I had a good run? (laughs) Then I've got people telling me I've got to write some kind of a life story. I said, I'm too young. I'm only 57. Write a life story. You think I'm dead? I said, we're still writing. I said, the best is yet to come. The greatest days ahead of us is not behind us. Are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? You write a life story when you're 80, 85, and you're about to go. Like Dr. Lester Sumrall wrote a book called Goodbye Earth. It's nice knowing you. You write that when you're about to leave the earth. You don't put a life story out when you're still writing the story. We can tell the story, but it's not a life story, please. Some people think I'm like, you know, a dinosaur. No, just because we've had revival from 1989 and the 90s and, and they, uh, Brother Rodney, you know, he's been around for decades. And What, do they think I'm on a walker? <laughs> no, thank God for what he did in the past, but the best is yet to come. It's not behind us. It's, it's ahead of us. Can you say Amen. Well, I just wish we could go back to the 90s. I don't, I don't. There's nothing in the 90s that I want to go back to. Are you, are you out of your mind? The anointing is stronger today than it was in the 90s. Somebody said, what do you mean? I know I was there. I was there then. I'm here now. And then everybody gauges off of crowds. Crowds. Crowds come and crowds go. Really, you're going to judge, judge it over crowds? Some of the biggest meetings and the biggest crowds were terrible meetings. I had to run half of the people off. Get rid of the looky loos. That's why I had long meetings till midnight, so that the moment the people left, then the fire of God fell. We had to run them out of Dodge. If it wasn't the music that would get them, then I would teach on giving, then that would clear the house. <laughs> Amen. And then I would say something just to offend some people, get them out of there. <laughs> Amen. On purpose. Some said, you're doing it on a purpose. You better believe it. You better believe. Some said, he's really calculated doing this on purpose. Yes. <laughs> Jesus, before he raised the dead, he had to get people out of the room. You can't have a move of God with every Tom, Dick, and Harry just sitting around nitpicking on what God's doing. We've got to impress them. Are you kidding me? Well, Brother Rodney, be nice. I am nice. But if the fire falls, you don't want to hang around if you're not right. You know what happened to Ananias and Sapphira? They dropped dead in the Holy Ghost service. Hmm? And we don't bury people. If you drop dead in this service, they'll find your cold corpse at one in the morning. And I've told my staff, don't call me if you find a dead corpse. Just call the mortuary. Not interested. Amen. 
Hallelujah. That's why you better be right with God coming to this church. If you go to a dead church and you fall over, they call the ambulance. You fall over here, nobody calls anybody. They just think you're under the anointing. I'm serious. You better be praying. If you're not right with God now, you better be praying. You don't keel over here in the service because ain't nobody going to bother with you. It'll be three o'clock this afternoon. They find your cold, dead corpse. Say, Pastor, I think somebody died in the service. I go, really? What happened? Yeah, we found them near the back. He was already stiff. Brother Rigamortis, we, we got his ID out. It was Brother Rigamortis. His wife was Sister Rigamortis. Their children were all the mortises. No, I don't want people to die, but by the same token, we're not here to impress anybody. You know, we're not here to get this acceptable, like we have to convince somebody. It's already proven. Can you say amen? Now, quickly, let me go through this. So it was important. If it wasn't for the fire of God, I would not even be here today. I can tell you the fire of God carries you through every obstacle. And we've had many obstacles. We've had many attacks. Like I said earlier, if it wasn't for the fire of God, I'd probably be in a mental institution in straitjacket going ministry, ministry, ministry. And that was just from the stuff we've been through in the ministry. But the fire of God and the joy keeps you. It keeps you. It keeps you. Jesus was baptized in the Holy Ghost. Somebody said, you mean Jesus? Yes. He came down and was baptized in the Jordan. Look at Matthew 3, 13. Then cometh Jesus to Galilee, to Jordan, to be baptized. But John forbade him, saying, I need to be baptized of you. And you come to me. Jesus answers, they suffer it to be now. For thus becometh unto us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Jesus was baptized and went up out of the water, and the heavens opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the Holy Spirit came on him. From that moment of time, Jesus was then empowered, and he went about miracles, signs, and wonders, Bible says, Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good and healing all the repressed of the devil for God was with them. John 3, 34, for since he whom God had sent speaks the word of God, proclaims God's own message, God does not give him his spirit sparingly or by measure, but boundless is the gift God makes of his spirit. So the, the Holy Ghost rested upon Jesus if it was important for Jesus to be baptized in the Holy Ghost, then let me tell you, none of his ministry started until that baptism. He didn't perform miracles as a child. The first miracle he did, he turned water into wine. Which is funny, that's what he does in our meetings because the word is the water and we fill you up with the word and then he snaps his finger and it turns to wine. So Jesus does that miracle all the time in our meetings Water's turned to wine. Some of your water will be turned to wine. Some of you have been having f containers full of vinegar. God will fix that today. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Paul was saved and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You can read about that in Acts chapter 9, verses 1 through 22. The great apostle Paul was converted and was baptized in the Holy Ghost. Moses had a burning bush experience. It's interesting that it was with fire that that burning bush experience took place. And like I always say, I don't have proof of it, but I believe when Moses went to stand in front of Pharaoh and he pointed his finger and said, let my people go, that if you could look into Moses' eyes, you would still see the flickering of the flames of the bush. Are you with me? Because you don't go up to Pharaoh and tell him to do anything if you don't have the fire of God. Hallelujah. That's why God uses ordinary people. It's not about this great man, this great woman. It's about ordinary men and ordinary women with a great God. Can you say amen? 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel the fire of God here right now. I feel the fire of the Holy Ghost right now in this place. The disciples were all filled, along with Mary. Somebody said, Mary? Yeah, Mary was filled. She was there in the upper room on that day. Yes. Amen. Acts 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost fully come, there all was one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind filled all the house of this city and depended on them cloven tongues like as a fire sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. But the fire was on each one of them. And that fire spread out. It's a fire that cannot be contained. If the fire of God that is on you only works inside here, there's a problem. There's a problem. The fire is for when you walk out of these doors. The fire is to help you in your home, in your marriage, your children, your grandchildren, your work, your play, and everything that you do. Cornelius and his house were filled, and he was Italian. And God sent Peter to Cornelius' house in Acts 10, 44. While Peter was speaking, while Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell. Acts 19, verses 1 to 7. It came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus and finding certain disciples, they said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we've not even heard it whether there be any Holy Ghost. How many know there's many people, even in the city of Tampa, that don't even know there is a Holy Ghost? They don't know that. And he said, under one baptism, were you baptized? They said, oh, John, baptism. And then Paul said, John truly baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized this time in the name of the Lord Jesus. And Paul laid his hands upon them, and the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 of them. So right through the book of Acts, you see people coming into the new birth, and then coming into the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. That's how the church functions. That's why we run into 300 cities of the world, to have upper room meetings, to challenge the people, get people saved, get people back to their first love, and then put the fire on them. Can you say amen? What does God want to do with everybody? Get them saved, get them free, and put fire on them. Can you say amen? My job is to get people saved, get them free, and put fire on them. Hallelujah. 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 Glory to God. So, you have to rekindle. I meet many ministers, and I'm going to close with this. I meet many ministers that the fire of God once was on them. And then they, because of persecution, they backed off. You will not believe how many ministers come to me. And say, Brother Rodney, years ago when our ministry started, we had the fire, but we were persecuted so much, we backed off from it. Do you know how many people think you cannot have a church and have fire? Did you know that? Who knew that you can have a church like the river and have fire? I didn't even find that in the Bible. You don't find any warning in the book of Acts. Be careful now that you do not have too much fire. Because if you have too much fire, it'll burn your whole church up. Well, the people say that God can't move every service. That's like saying the restaurant can't serve food any time you go. If a restaurant's open 24 hours and they got the menu, what does it do? It serves food. When does it serve food? When you walk in and place the order. Well, we just can't have the fire today. Who, who's here? Who? Where? Show me.
whenever I see people, I think we've got to get them saved and then we've got to put fire on them. Because if the fire of God ever gets them, they're going to step into another dimension. They're going to go places. They're going to do things for God that is only written about in history books. There's people in this room that are called to write history. You, you're not called to read it. You're called to write it. You are called to write history. That's the fire of God falling right now. All over the place. Somebody said, how do you know? I could feel it. It's my job. Come here, dear sister, come here. Jesus! Somebody said, you pushed her over. You could see that? <laughs> Amazing. That's the new ministerial retractable arm. You can pick it up for 1995. Comes in three colors. No, I didn't even touch her. That's the power of the Holy Ghost. Somebody said, well, does she have to fall down? You don't have to. Just stand there like a blimp. This is not about, trust me, the, 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 the proof of the service is not how many people fall down. The true proof of the service is what happens when you leave here and you go out of here and the people that are touched. This young lady right here, three, three in. Come, come, step right over here. Step right over here in the clearing. Step over in the clearing. Close your eyes. Lift your hands as you do. Fire from the top of your head to the very soles of your feet. Now that is unnerving to religion. But they wouldn't have hung around the upper room for one second. What month was it, Pastor Eric? November of 1996. The fire came on him as a businessman, making millions of dollars. Pull the clip. I've got the clip of the actual service where he got touched, where the fire hit him in Lake Charles, Louisiana, 1996. As a businessman and a woman came from West Palm Beach and the fire of God hit him. And within a year, they were in Bible school in the charter class of River Bible Institute. One year later, they were traveling with us and now I've traveled 22 years into what, 30... 41 countries of the world. Let me tell you, roll it, roll it, roll it, roll it. Without the fire, you won't do it. Come here, lady. Step right over here. I had a little bit more Close here. your eyes, lift your hands as you do. The power of God comes upon you. Come here, lady. Step right over here. Close your eyes, lift your hands. Come here, both of you. Step right back there. 1996. Close 96. Your eyes, lift your hands as you do the power of God. Feel. Feel. Come here, dear lady. Go back over there. You two. Ushers, ushers, Go back over there. You two. 
Help him, ushers, quickly, quickly. Ushers, ushers. ushers. Where are they? Ushers, help. Same problem. Bring them, put them in the line, put them in the line. We're the ushers. Lift your hands. Filled right now. Pill, pill, pill. From the top of your head. There's Pastor the Eric in the blue shirt. There Phil. he is. There's Pastor this is Jennifer. God's operating table. Come here, brother. Stand right here. The fire of the Holy Ghost. Okay, bring him back. Bring him back. Lady, step right back. That was the first time he ever fell under the power. Ever. There'd been in many meetings, people laid hands on him, they were the only ones standing. But that night, the fire of God come upon his life. There's nothing wrong with you. The little bit more, the fire of God wouldn't cure. And when that fire comes on you, you have to do everything you can within your power to kindle that flame and stir up that fire and not let anything put that fire out. Not for anything that the world has to offer. Not for fame, not for fortune, not to become acceptable. There were people that said to me, if you would just drop this stuff, we'd have you in our church. No. Bring him here. Bring this man here. Bring him to me. Look at me. Fire. From the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Somebody said, what's God going to do with him? I don't know, but people are going to write history. They're going to write history with the fire of heaven upon them. And God is going to use them. Hallelujah. 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 Fuego, 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 más fuego. Fuego de Dios. <clears throat> Let me say this. You might say, but pastor, people will think I'm crazy. I got news for you. They already do. They already think you're crazy. For those that might get persecuted because of the fire of God, remember this, you were persecuted with no fire. <laughs> you were criticized for no fire. She so might as well just be criticized for fire now. When the fire of the Holy Ghost comes, it wreaks havoc in the natural mind. On the day of Pentecost, they thought they were drunk. They thought they were drunk. Peter said, these are not drunk as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Some people were amazed. Some people were in doubt. Others marveled. Some people thought they were mad. They were crazed. Lord, let your fire come on every hungry person and set them ablaze. As the old African-American preacher prayed and he said, Lord, dip me, dip me in the kerosene of thy spirit and set my heart ablaze that I may burn for you, that you would Dip them in the kerosene of the Holy Ghost. May this church be an upper room of launching people to the far flung corners of the globe.
That fire will get on your mouth. That fire will get on your hands. The fire will get on your feet. You'll say like the prophet of old, it's just like a fire shut up in my bones. The fire's for the young. The fire's for the old. The fire's for all those that are living. He said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. All flesh means all flesh because that's what all flesh means. When the fire of God comes on you, it'll burn out sickness and disease. It'll burn cancer out of your body. It'll burn out every blood virus. It'll burn out every ailment, everything. It'll burn out every addiction, no matter what kind of drug, alcohol. It'll burn it out of you. It'll remove it from your life. It'll heal your marriage. It'll heal your home. It'll heal your children. Back in the early days, when the revival first broke out, a lady stormed out of the meeting. She didn't like what was happening. And she got to her car and the power of God struck her. She couldn't even get the keys in the ignition. And she sat shaking under the power of God. And about 30 minutes later, she, the door flies open and she comes back in. And she said, I was trying to leave. She said, I thought you were crazy. But the fire of God grabbed her behind the wheel of the car and shook her like a rag doll. And she came in and the Holy Ghost touched her. One person was standing mocking, mocking, and the power of God froze them and stuck them to the back wall. They were just stuck against the back wall and couldn't move. For nearly an hour until they surrendered and said, Lord, I believe, I believe, I believe, I believe. We're not reading just words from a Bible that have no relevance today. We're not just reading something from a history book. The same Holy Ghost is still alive today. This same fire is still available today. This fire we have to stir up. We have to keep burning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. It's this fire that will shake the city of Tampa. It will shake the schools, the universities, the places of business, the places of government. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. I want everybody to bow your heads across this room. Let me ask a question. How many of you just sitting here, you feel the fire of God on you today? Just wave your hand at me. Keep your hand in the air. So see, this is not about just the laying on of hands because the very presence of the Lord has invaded this place and God's touching people at the back row and in the front row equally. And God will touch you in your homes today. Somebody said, but I didn't fall down like one of those people. It doesn't matter. It's not about falling down. If it was about falling down, we could all come in here at 9.45 and I could have counted one, two, three. We could all fall down and we could have all gone home already. It's about listening to the word and letting the word come and burn in our hearts. And that fire that comes upon us to anoint us for service. You can put your hands down. Now, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, maybe you came here tonight, today, and a friend brought you, or you came on the buses or whatever, but you've never given your life to Jesus. You've never said, Jesus, come and be my Lord and Savior. But today, I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm going to surrender my life today. The number one prerequisite to receiving the Holy Ghost, you have to be saved. You must be born again. So I want to give you that opportunity. What would happen if today was your last day on the earth? 
if you went from this place tonight, lay on your pillow and you never woke up in the morning, where would you go? Where would you spend eternity? I want you to know there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Today you can surrender to him. Today you can say, Jesus, I give you my life. We're not talking about religion. We're talking about a relationship with Jesus. Religion, you have to have it through somebody. You have to have a relationship through a priest or a bishop or somebody that you think is closer to Jesus than you. But a relationship is where you personally have that relationship with him without any other man standing in the way. And today, I want you to know he loves you and he stands with arms right open and he says, come, surrender. Will you do that today? Will you say, Jesus, come and be my Lord and Savior? Secondly, maybe you've come to this place and you gave your life to the Lord in days gone by, but you've grown cold. You're not serving God. Maybe you let that fire go out. You let that fire wane. You, what the Bible talks about in the book of Revelation chapter 3, lukewarm. But today you say, I want to come back to that fire. Maybe it's something hidden that no one could see. Pride, unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy, anger, lust, the hidden things that clog the heart of man. Maybe it's something outward that everyone could see and now the devil uses it against you to keep it in a place of guilt and condemnation. You feel like God will never use you because of things that have transpired in your life. But I want you to know that God is a God of a new beginning and God is a God of a second chance. Will you say, Lord, come. Take full control of my life. He will come and do that. Maybe it's not hidden or outward as we describe. Maybe it's a storm. It came out against your life, a sudden divorce, a bankruptcy, the loss of a loved one, a sudden illness, but the betrayal of a close friend, the loss of a job. Something happened that rocked your world. But today you say, I'm coming back. And then lastly, you're in this place, you love the Lord, but you're not sure of your salvation. The devil's always lying to you, telling you that you're not saved, but today you want to make sure that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. If this is you, right where you are, without any hesitation whatsoever, quickly put your hand up and say, pray for me. God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you, God bless you. Quickly, slip it up high, let me see it all over the building. God bless you over here, God bless you over there, God bless you over there, raise up high. God bless you over here, sir, God bless you. God bless you over there. God bless you back under the overhang, all of the side over here. God bless you, dear sister. God bless you, brother. God bless you, sister. All the way through. If God can touch Socrates, he can touch you too. Once you've raised it, you can put it down. I want you to look at me now, please. Look at me in this section. You didn't raise your hand, but you want to be included in the prayer. I'm going to pray right now. Quickly, right where you are, put your hand up and say, include me. Include me. I see your hand. I've seen your hand. Thank you at the back. Anybody else right over there? Thank you. Anybody else? Another hand right at the back. This section. God bless you. God bless you over here. God bless you over there. Anybody right at the back? Yes, you, sir. You, sir. Yes. Anybody else, just raise up high and say, yes, that's me. I want to be included. I've seen your hand already. Anybody else? God bless you, sister. Anybody else? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. God bless you, brother. Anybody else? Yes, sir. God bless you. Anybody else? Anyone else? Just slip it up high. God bless you, sister. God bless you. God bless you, brother. Yes, right at the back there. Anybody else? Just raise up high and say, yes, that's me. Yes, I've seen your hand. I want everyone that raised your hand, I want you to stand right now, please. All across the building, just stand to your feet. Stand to your feet. Everyone that raised your hand, stand. Stand right now. Everyone that raised your hand, stand. Stand to your feet. Everyone, 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 everyone that raised your hand. Come on, come on. Us just help them. I want to pray for you. I want you to come from where you are. Come stand here. Come. We're going to lead you in a prayer. Today is your day. Come. Come, sister. Come. We're going to pray. We're going to pray. You can bring your personal belongings and come. If you've seen people raise their hand, help them to come. Just encourage them to come. This is so very important. Muy importante today. He calls you. He calls you today. He says, come. Today is your day of salvation and freedom. Come right now. Come right now. No turning back. No turning back. back. 
the cross before him. Bring him here, bro. Bring him here. Come. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. No turning back. No turning back. You can take the whole world. But give me Jesus. You can take the whole world. But give me Jesus. You can take the whole world. But give me Jesus. No turning back. So in the days gone by, we used to fly in neighborhoods and load buses and bring people in. We stopped doing that. Well, now it's just up to the home groups to bring the people in. And all, each home group just has to bring one person per week. It's not hard. I mean, some up to 12 people in a home group, at least one person can find one person to bring. Pastor Eric and Jennifer got so on fire, they would bring 45 people to church every time they showed up at church. So it's all about the fire of God getting on you. Somebody said, well, that will mean I'll have to do something and pick people up in the car. Well, at least your car will be used to bring people. I just felt the Lord tell me, just, you know, we, we, we do the whole outreach and reaching people. It's time for the home groups to do that. And then when people get saved from the neighborhoods, then they can come into your home group. Then your home group's going to grow because you brought the people. That's the next level. Don't make me come and visit each home group. I'll lay hands on you. Let me tell you. We've got to shake the city of Tampa. We have a window to do this. It's not about growing a church. As Kelly, my daughter, used to say, gag me with a spoon. It's not about growing a church. It's about growing the kingdom amen. and seeing the power of God spread across the city. Can you say amen? amen? Obviously, not everybody's going to come to the River Church. Obviously, I know that. I'm not stupid. To be totally frank with you, or get frank, I'll just be Rodney and tell you, I don't want everybody in the church. I don't want everybody in this church. What do you mean you don't want everybody in this church? I want people that walk in here and go, I'm home. I don't mind visitors. Visitors can come visit us. But you try to keep visitors and make them at home, they cause trouble. So I'm not looking for people that, you know, you either come in here and you feel at home, like the new members, what, 40 plus of them that joined today, or you feel like a fish out of water. That's fine. Go back to your church, but at least become active in the kingdom of God and win souls. Otherwise, you just become a pew warmer. And you'll be sorry on that day because you have nothing to show for your life on the earth. You, have, you didn't take anybody with you. You arrived in heaven by yourself. Only a selfish person arrives in heaven all by yourself. And then you have to look at Jesus and you have to tell him why you didn't do anything. Oh Lord, I, I wanted to, but I was so busy and you blessed me so much and you looked after me, but I was so busy with all my blessings that I didn't share it and help anybody else. Amen. And I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm just telling you. 
Fire, no fire. Fire or smoke? Fire or smoke? Fire or smoke? Fire. They all shouting fire. They, people at the altar shouting fire. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, let's see the city shaken by the hand of God. I want you to look at me. We're going to pray. One prayer fits all. If you mean business with God, God means business with you. He loves you. And today, whether you come for the very first time, it's going to be okay, son. It's going to be fine. Just relax. Your mom's fine. She's not going anywhere. We're going to pray together here. And you don't need the phone. Trust me. You don't need it on either. Listen to what I'm going to say. How old is he? Three. Three. You can grab this too. Three years old? You can grab this. This is for you. Exactly. Don't frown at me. Okay. So let's, we're going to pray together. Close your eyes, raise your right hand to heaven and say this out loud. Say, Father, I come to you in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Lord, you said in your word, if I confess with my mouth, Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. And I believe in my heart that God has raised you from the dead. I will be saved. So Father, right now, I confess Jesus is my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart right now. Take out the stony heart. Put in a heart of flesh. Wash me. Cleanse me. Change me. Fill me. Use me. Let me never be the same again. I turn my back on the world. I turn my back on sin. And I follow you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for shedding your blood for me. Thank you that on the third day you rose for me. And thank you that you're coming back again for me. From this day on, I'll never be the same again. I confess Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He is my Lord and my Savior. And right now, by faith in the finished work of the cross and by the shed blood of Jesus, I am saved. Thank you, Lord, for saving me now. Now lift both hands and just thank him. Father, I pray that you would seal them even now by your blood and by your spirit and that you will use them in a mighty way. Let the very fire of the Holy Ghost come upon each of them and use them. Let them write history. Let not one be missing on that day. Let them be mighty men and women of God. And we pray this now in Jesus' name. In el nombre de Jesús. And everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Thank you for watching today on YouTube. Please press the subscribe button and also the notification button and like and get the word out so others can watch.